Tonight, the most serious charge and high profile arrest connected to the Capitol riot. Members of the far right group, the Oath Keepers, accused of plotting a violent attack to stop members of Congress from counting electoral votes. Their leader allegedly calling for more violence following the insurrection, warning of another civil war as President Biden was sworn into office. Meanwhile, in Congress, top House Republican Kevin McCarthy refusing to cooperate with the January 6th committee. Debate threat. The RNC saying it's moving to prohibit its party's nominees from presidential and vice presidential debates. Will we ever see the candidates on stage again? What it could mean for the next election. Also, the Supreme Court issuing a major blow tonight to President Biden, blocking his vaccine mandate for all private companies with 100 or more employees. The court, however, allowing similar requirements for health care workers. As hospitals deal with massive shortages, one in five health care workers quitting since the pandemic began. The president now sending in troops to hospitals in several states. Outrage tonight after an Illinois judge reversed the sexual assault conviction of an 18 year old saying his four months in jail was enough punishment. The accuser coming forward describing what happened and the moment she was in court when that decision was made. Royal stunner Prince Andrew stripped of his military and royal titles as he faces a sex abuse lawsuit from a woman who says she was trafficked for the prince by Jeffrey Epstein. His mother, the queen, approving the move. And yay, under criminal investigation, Kanye West now suspected of attacking a fan in Los Angeles. Top story starts right now. And good evening, I'm Tom Yamas. We begin top story tonight with what may be the biggest development to date surrounding the Capitol riot. The first edition charges handed down from that day. Stuart Rhodes, the founder and leader of the far right group, the Oath Keepers, and at least 10 other members accused of planning and participating in violence in an attempt to stop Congress from certifying President Biden's election victory. The unsealed indictment revealing encrypted messages sent by Rhodes to his followers warning of a, quote, civil war days before the insurrection direction and threatening more violence weeks later as President Biden was sworn into office. Also tonight, a battle within Congress. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy now refusing a request by the January 6th committee to share conversations he had within President Trump as an angry mob stormed the Capitol. We have a lot to get to tonight. We want to begin with NBC News Justice correspondent Pete Williams, who leads us off from Washington. It's the most high-profile charge yet stemming from the Capitol riot. Stuart Rhodes of Texas, the leader of the far-right Oath Keepers, is in federal custody tonight, accused of conspiring with 10 other members of the group to carry out acts of violence to stop Congress from formally counting the Electoral College vote for president. They're charged with the crime of seditious conspiracy. While all conspiracies are serious, a seditious conspiracy, an unusual federal charge, not often brought, is even more serious. As early as two days after the election, prosecutors say Rhodes reached out to his group's leadership team with this encrypted message, we aren't getting through this without a civil war. In late December, court documents say he messaged the team, we need to make those senators very uncomfortable with all of us being a few hundred feet away. The day before the riot, the FBI says one of the Oath Keepers drove around the U.S. Capitol on a reconnaissance mission. On January 6th, the government says as rioters began breaking through police lines, Rhodes messaged his leadership saying the nation's founders stormed the governor's mansion in Massachusetts. A short time later, Oath Keepers began working their way into the Capitol in two groups lined up in military-style formation. Stuart Rhodes remained outside the building, but in the hours after the riot, the government says, he met with his team to plan further violence. In the following weeks, prosecutors say he spent more than $17,000 buying weapons and ammunition. And on Inauguration Day, they say Rhodes messaged, after this, if nothing happens, it's war, Civil War 2.0. All right, Pete joins us now from Washington. Pete, are we hearing anything else from Rhodes or his lawyers tonight? Well, yes, his lawyer tells NBC News that he doesn't think the evidence supports the charge in today's indictment. Uh, we have not heard from Rhodes himself. But last year, he said that members of his group went off mission when they entered the Capitol, that he never instructed them to do that. You know, Pete, leading up to the anniversary of the January 6th insurrection, I, I can remember you saying time and time again, the big thing we don't know yet, was there a plot, was there a plan to take over the Capitol, to move into the Capitol? We're learning more today from the DOJ investigation, but where do you think the investigation goes from here? 
Yeah, I still think we don't know the answer to that question of whether someone had a well-developed plan in advance. What these charges today say is that these members came to Washington intending to commit violence to stop the vote. A lot of what's in this indictment today depends on finding out what was in the encrypted apps that these people were exchanging. And there have already been two guilty pleas among the Oath Keepers. So as these cases go along, we come to trials, we'll probably learn a lot more about that. All right, Pete Williams leading us off tonight. Pete, thank you. As we mentioned at the top of the broadcast, top House Republican Kevin McCarthy refusing to cooperate with the January 6th committee about his contacts with former President Trump during that attack. NBC's Garrett Hake has more from Capitol Hill. Top House Republican Kevin McCarthy defiant tonight in the face of a request for testimony from the January 6th committee. There is nothing that I can provide the January 6th committee for legislation of their moving forward. There is nothing in that realm. It is pure politics of what they're playing. McCarthy's refusal now to detail his conversations with Donald Trump during and after the attack, a departure from his position last summer. Would you be willing to testify about your conversation with Donald Trump on January 6th if you were asked by an outside commission? Sure. You Next would. question. The Republican leader now joining two other House Republicans in refusing to cooperate. Is it problematic for the investigation if all House Republicans just have refused to talk to them? No, but we will seek the truth. We will find the truth. Now the committee, who say they have conducted nearly 400 interviews, must decide what steps they're willing to take to secure those of their colleagues. What is the conversation about whether or not they can or should be given a subpoena to come testify? Uh, we're not there yet. At its core, we really just think that folks, uh, if they're guided by the same constitutional oath that we took, uh, should come and speak before us. All right, Garrett joins us again from Capitol Hill tonight. And Garrett, do we know what changed for the House Minority Leader from then to now? As you highlighted in your report there, there was a clear change in what he planned to do. Well, it may be as simple as the politics change, Tom. The minority leader wants very badly to be the Speaker of the House in the next Congress, and he knows he needs Donald Trump in his corner for that. Having a united front here for all House Republicans to say they're going to stand up to this committee is something he thinks is a winning political issue for him. And Garrett, speaking of Congress, there was more breaking news on the Hill today. Democrat, Democratic Senator Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin essentially derailing the president's plan for a voting rights bill and breaking with their party in the filibuster. Yeah, Sinema doing it in the most public way possible with a floor speech just moments before President Biden arrived on the Hill. She said as much as she supports these voting rights measures, she will not change Senate rules uh, to allow for them to pass. Joe Manchin said the same thing in a paper statement after the fact. Uh, Tom, these two senators have been fairly consistent on this point for months now with their backs up against the wall. There's little left for Senate Democrats to do, but believe them and perhaps see these votes fail in the coming days. All right, Garrett Hake on Capitol Hill for us. Garrett, thank you. And another major political headline tonight. With the potential to shake up the 2024 election, the RNC threatening to pull out of future presidential debates, potentially barring any Republican nominees from participating. The move could put one of the cornerstones of the election process in jeopardy. Here's NBC's Von Hilliard. In a move that could end a decades-long political tradition, tonight the Republican National Committee threatening to bar future candidates from participating in official presidential debates. Well, that's because he'd rather have a puppet as president of no the United puppet. States. No puppet. And it's pretty clear. You're the puppet. It's the RNC considering a requirement for its nominee to pledge that they will not take part in any debates sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. Former President Trump has been a vocal opponent of the commission, unhappy with everything from the dates picked for the 2016 debates against Hillary Clinton. They're against the NFL. I saw the dates, too. I think two of the three are against the NFL, so I'm not thrilled with that. To the moderators. And I think that the the anchor is a, a very uh, biased person. Her parents are very biased. And after a chaotic first round debate with President Joe Biden. I'm not going to answer the question. Why because, would you answer that because question? Because the you question is, the new question Supreme is, Court justice, the radical question, left. Will you shut who is up, man? Listen, who the CPB changing the rules to allow moderators to mute candidates' mics in future debates a move the Trump campaign called an attempt to provide advantage to their favored candidate. This could be a case where Donald Trump felt that he was damaged by his debate performance, especially in the first debate in 2020, and he wants to foreclose the possibility that he's going to be compelled to be in a debate that 
may make him look bad. Each man shall make an opening statement. Of now at stake if the RNC pulls out, a tradition dating back to 1960 when John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon squared off in the first televised presidential debate. In the years since, debates generating unforgettable moments from the lighthearted. And I believe I can. To the contentious. Do you want to call him? What do you want to call him? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and white right like supremacists. White proud proud supremacists and right proud proud boys, boys, stand back and stand by. Moments that had the American public not seen could have changed the outcome of an election. There are not many ways that we voters are able to hold candidates to account during the course of a campaign. One of those ways since 1976 has been TV debates. Now the Republican committee is saying, we're gonna possibly take those away. It's a reduction in our level of democracy. All right, Von Hiller joins us now and said, Von, this is a serious issue. We both cover politics, have covered presidential elections. These debates are a cornerstone sort of of the process, but you have to think the RNC is serious when they're threatening to pull out. They, this is something you could definitely see them doing possibly in the next election cycle. Right, and the RNC and the Trump campaign, they were the ones maneuvering before those debates in the 2020 uh, election cycle. Putting a lot of pressure, right? A lot of pressure. They even released a list of moderators who were acceptable to them. Ultimately, the commission is going to do what they want, and that's exactly what they did. Did. They picked three moderators. Chris Wallace the, uh, was part of that chaotic first one. Our Kristen uh, uh, Walker. Walker was the, uh, the moderator of the second. I don't think anybody was disputing how fair they were. And the commission is very clear in its statement today saying they will not negotiate with the RNC because they work directly with the candidates, not with the parties. Of course, the question is, who is the Republican candidate going to be? If it's Donald Trump, it looks like the RNC is doing a lot of posturing on the front end. Tom? And we'll know for sure in a couple of years if those debates happen. All right, Vaughn, thank you. Now to the weather. Large parts of the country on winter storm watch with millions under winter alerts across parts of the northern plains and Midwest. But first, in Washington, the Snoqualmie River raging. Major flooding, trapping vehicles you see there. That military truck stuck in a ditch. And off the coast of Lake Erie, ice dunes forming over the past week. Take a look at that. The region gearing up for an Arctic blast this weekend. That frigid cold part of a storm system threatening large large parts of the country with a wintry mix. Al Roker back on Top Story again with us tonight. So Al, walk us through the next couple of days. Okay, so first time where the setup is, we've got bitterly cold air coming in. Wind chills between 20 to 40 degrees below zero. Temperatures 10 to 25 degrees. Air temperatures below average. We're talking 15, 16 million people under winter storm weather advisories, storm watches, warnings from the Dakotas all the way down to the Carolinas. So late Friday, low pressure slides out of Canada. Canada. We know that there's going to be snow from the northern plains into the Midwest. We're talking about some places picking up to a foot of snow before it's all over through Saturday morning, but on average, four to eight inches of snow. That system dives to the south, picks up a lot of Gulf moisture, but it is going to see a significant ice storm going on through the southeast into the southeastern Atlantic coast. We are talking about heavy ice from Columbia on into central, the central Carolinas. We're talking about about the possibility of airport delays from Atlanta all the way up to Richmond and power outages as well. Now, here's the weather wild card. As this system slides up the coast, it's going to bring rain, snow, gusty conditions. The location of the rain snow line, very uncertain. If it keeps this path, the heaviest snow will stay inland. Inland parts of New England, upstate New York, Pennsylvania, on into the Appalachians. But Tom, if this thing slides about 25, 30 miles to the east, we are talking a major snow snowstorm for I-95 for the morning rush hour on Monday. All right, Al, I know you'll be tracking this through the next several days. Thank you for that. Over now to the Supreme Court. The justices today blocking the Biden administration's vaccine or test mandate for large private companies nationwide. But the court said similar requirements impacting 20 million health care workers can be enforced as Omicron variants continue to surge around the country. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has the latest. Three days after the Biden administration's COVID vaccine or test mandate for private companies with more than 100 workers started to take effect, today the U.S. Supreme Court blocked it, writing that OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, did not have the power to regulate public health. The mandate had affected some 80 million Americans, including James Crocker's employees at his Florida company. I saw this mandate from the very beginning as perhaps the greatest uh, example of government overreach. President Biden called the ruling disappointing, 
arguing that if his administration had not put vaccination requirements in place, we would now be experiencing a higher death toll from COVID-19 and even more hospitalizations. The ruling was 6-3, to three, with the six conservative justices in the majority and the three liberal justices dissenting. But in a separate 5-4 to four decision, the high court allowed similar COVID requirements to stand for medical facilities that take Medicare or Medicaid payments. It will cover 17 million health care workers at 76,000 medical facilities. The Supreme Court upheld it, and we will enforce that. It all comes as the Biden administration scrambles to fight a frustratingly resurgent pandemic, vaccine misinformation, and a highly transmissible variant. While the most recent data suggests that Omicron may be leveling off in some East Coast cities, overall cases and hospitalizations remain high nationwide. Now the president is sending in the military to hospitals in six hard-hit states, including the Cleveland Clinic, the University of New Mexico, and Rhode Island Hospital. And he says his administration will make higher quality masks available to Americans for free. I know we all wish that we could finally be done with wearing masks. I get it. But they're, they're a really important tool to stop the spread. All right, Gabe joins us now again on the COVID beat for us. So, Gabe, let's go back to that first Supreme Court ruling you mentioned there in your story. What's the bottom line for all these big businesses? Well, Tom, they can still impose vaccine mandates or testing requirements if they want to. But what today's ruling means is that the federal government can't force them to do it. Tom? All right, Gabe, thank you for that. Now to a striking new, some striking new data showing just how dire the strain is on the nation's health care workers. A survey showing nearly one in five of them have quit their jobs since the pandemic began. Our Priscilla Thompson spoke to some of those workers who've been on the front lines since well before the pandemic, including one critical care nurse who decided it was time to quit. We're all here for you, but we need you all to be here for us. We're tired. We're exhausted. We're all taking care of more patients than we ever have. I would never in my wildest dream would have imagined that we would be here again. It's the great resignation hitting the healthcare industry at the worst possible time. How many people did you see leave? Out of my group of eight, there are Two people left. Nearly one in five healthcare workers have quit their job during the pandemic. Peter Sidhu is one of them. He left his job as a California ICU nurse in April of last year. I was scared. We were going to a workplace where one, we weren't going to have enough staff. Two, we weren't going to get our breaks. And three, you were most likely going to see or witness some kind of a death. Burnout is one problem, among others. I felt that nobody had our back. For years now, we've talked about staffing. But COVID's been around for two years, and what have they really done? Data shows as many as 54% of nurses and physicians were already burned out before the pandemic even began. Now, healthcare workers are leaving in droves for higher paying jobs, better benefits, and more opportunity. Is this only going to get worse? If nothing is done, I am concerned that this will get worse. Vanit Aurora is in charge of training the next generation of doctors at the University of Chicago. Either you decide that you're gonna stay in your job, but you have to care less just to get through the day, or you leave your job. Those resignations plus workers out with COVID are causing major problems. Almost a quarter of hospitals nationwide reporting a critical staffing shortage, prompting calls for change. <laughs> Nurses from DC to California picketing to demand better working conditions. What can be done to fix this? Canceling educational debt, loan repayment programs, regulatory relief so that we can train more physicians and nurses, improvements in safety in the workplaces. Solutions to stop the bleed before it's too late. We're not firefighters. We're, we're not in the military. We're not the police. We are healthcare workers. And now we're losing our lives and we're losing our careers. All right, Priscilla Thompson joins us now live in studio. Priscilla, I know you've been all over this healthcare worker issue. We were also talking about earlier in the week some healthcare workers who have COVID who are being asked to work and treat patients. And now we have a new story on our website, NBCNews.com. And this is almost hard to believe. They're asking people who get sick with COVID, healthcare workers, to take vacation days when they're sick. 
Yeah. Tom, as the policies around when healthcare workers can return to work after testing positive are changing, so too are the policies around how and whether they are going to be paid for taking that time off for COVID related issues. And what my colleagues on the digital team have found in talking to healthcare workers around the country is that some of them are being asked to use their vacation days, to use their paid time off. And of course, they are not happy about that. And so we're talking about this shortage. We're talking about healthcare workers feeling undervalued, underappreciated, and that is certainly not helping. It, it is such a mess. Priscilla, thank you for this story. And it's not just healthcare workers, now to another group of essential workers, supermarket employees, thousands of them walking off the job in Colorado, the latest members of the American workforce to do so. Emily Aketa has more on what they're demanding in their standoff with a major supermarket chain. Shop. The so-called year of the worker presses on into 2022 as more than 8,000 employees at Kroger owned King Supers are now on strike in Colorado. Who's got the power? We got the power. They're demanding better wages, more robust benefits and stricter safety measures as essential workers in the pandemic. It seems like the people just don't matter. They just want their profit. The strike is the latest in a wave of labor union demonstrations from John Deere to Kellogg's and Nabisco. How has the pandemic awakened this worker empowerment? It is really very much a product of a tight labor market that has increased the leverage and work and power of workers. We're ultimately seeing this in record levels of quits as well as record levels of hires. Workers are making their stand at a time when stores nationwide are struggling to stock shelves and the strike could grow in the coming days. They're essential workers, but they're being treated as sacrificial and disposable workers. A new study commissioned by the union indicates more than three quarters of Kroger workers surveyed in several states are food insecure. Kroger calls that report misleading, releasing its own research showing the company on average pays hourly workers more than its peers as it pushes back against the strike. Nobody wins. Not our customers, not our associates, not the union and not the company. The grocery chain's final offer increased some employees' wages by $4.50 an hour and boosted starting pay to $16 an hour. The union rejected the proposal, leaving Kroger scrambling to hire temporary workers as Omicron fuels staffing shortages nationwide. All right, Emily Aketa joins us now in studio. So you have those supermarket shortages and now you have this strike there in Colorado. Do we have any idea how long this is going to last? Okay, so this is just the second day of the strike, but it could go on for weeks. And union leaders say that these demonstrations are likely going to grow in size because contracts are set to expire for more King Supers locations in the coming days. So a lot to watch. All right, Emily Aketa, and we should say your first time here on Top Story Live in studio. Great to have you in New York. Welcome. Yeah, happy to be here. All right. So from the supermarket to your home and business, inflation is hitting Americans hard across the board. Dasha Burns takes a look now at how the cost of food, transportation and energy are cutting into wallets. Tonight, as the cold winter months set in across the northern parts of the country, Americans getting hammered by higher costs. Year over year inflation accelerating, now reaching 7 percent, the largest 12 month jump since 1982. And with energy prices hitting record highs, Americans are feeling burned by heating costs. What has that meant for you and your family and, and your finances? It's very tough. Our house is almost all electric with the exception of two gas. Uh, we have a fireplace and then a, like a potbelly stove in our basement. Our electric bill is already up over $250. U.S. government forecasts for this winter estimate electricity costs to be up 5% from last year. But if you're using oil, natural gas or propane, you could be staring at a jump of more like 30 percent. It's leading people like Shannon Hunt, a personal trainer, to go to great lengths to keep the bills down. We're freezing. I'm wearing socks to bed. We have flannel sheets. We have like a flannel like down comforter with a duvet. Um, our dogs are snuggled up with us. That sting hitting other parts of the economy, too. The average price of a new car is now above $47,000, up more than six grand in 2021. And if you thought you'd do better with a used vehicle, those prices are up a whopping 37 percent in just the last year. And once you get the car, driving is not exactly cruise control. Gas prices up almost 50 percent. Even tires are up 12 percent. I haven't seen prices this high. For Norb Dotzel, all this creates roadblocks for his trucking and topsoil business in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania. And it's funny, when people call you for something now, they right away say to you, I know it's going to be a lot more money, but I need a price. We first met Norb back in October, and he was already feeling the pinch. Diesel fuel prices are 
through the roof, and they're not stopping. These days, Norb is having trouble getting everything from engine oil to the parts that keep his trucks on the road. What does it mean when gas is up, when tires are up, when so many things that are necessary for your business are so expensive and hard to get? I don't know. I just turned 65. I thought about retiring, but that's not going to happen. What am I going to do to all my guys? There's no way. I just got to stick it out. The question many Americans are asking, when will it end? Will I be priced out of my home? We're average middle class people. We have maybe one and a half or two jobs a piece. Where does it stop for us? You feel for all those Americans out there. Dasha Burns joins us now live in studio. So you spent a lot of time uh, with both Shannon and Norb. What, what kind of hits you most with how inflation is affecting them? Yeah, you know, it's really amazing talking to someone like Norb, who owns a trucking business, right? And he can't get his hands on something as simple as tires. Not only are they more expensive, but his supplier simply can't get them. So even if he's willing to pay the extra price, they're just not available right, right now because of these supply chain issues. And then Shannon is just a classic example of how the middle class is getting squeezed here. You know, for wealthier folks, a 4% inflation rate versus 7%, they might not notice, but Shannon certainly does, Tom. So what tips do you have for our viewers? Because I'm sure you learned a lot in reporting this. How can people, like, try to save money with high energy, high heating costs? Yeah, you know, it's really tough out there, especially this week. We saw those historically low uh, digits in terms of temperatures that all of us were feeling that yeah. cold. And as we were working on the story, we did find some resources for people in need. The federal government actually has a program called the Low Income Housing Energy Assistance Program. Uh, that's funding for folks that, that need it. So a lot of cities have programs where they can connect people with those resources. And there is some funding available at state and local levels as well, Tom. All right, Dasha, we thank you for that. A lot of important information there. Still ahead tonight, the royal fallout. Prince Andrew stripped of his military and royal titles as he faces a sex abuse lawsuit. Is the palace stepping back from the queen's second son? Plus, the Good Samaritan giving away his own coat in in the freezing cold, but then he's beaten and robbed by the person he was trying to help. What police are now revealing about that suspect. And the judge reversing a sex assault conviction of an 18-year-old saying he had spent enough time behind bars. His accuser now speaking out. Stay with us. Top story. Just getting started. Welcome back to Top Story. A judge in Illinois overturned a sexual assault conviction for a teen after telling the court the days he'd served in jail were enough. That decision now sparking outrage across the country, and the accuser is now coming forward. Here's Megan Fitzgerald. Tonight, anger and outrage after an Illinois judge decided to reverse his own decision in the sexual assault conviction of an 18-year-old at his sentencing hearing, now saying the 148 days he spent behind bars is, quote, plenty of punishment, and ruling the court will find him not guilty on all counts. Drew Clinton was initially found guilty of one count of criminal sexual assault of a 16-year-old girl at a bench trial in October, a charge that carries a mandatory minimum sentence of four years in prison. The accuser, Cameron Vaughn, identified herself to NBC affiliate WGEM. She alleges Clinton sexually assaulted her at a graduation party in May when she was unconscious. I woke up at my friend's house with a pillow over my face so I couldn't be heard and Drew Clinton inside of me. Adam County Judge Robert Adrian decided Clinton should not be transferred to prison after his 148 days spent in county jail. Court transcripts showing the judge placed blame on parents hosting teenagers at a party. Quote, they provided liquor to underage people, and you wonder how these things happen. Well, that's how these things happen. Vaughn shocked by the decision. I immediately had to leave the courtroom and go to the bathroom. I was crying. Clinton's attorney maintains his client should have been found not guilty on all three counts of criminal sexual assault at the trial telling NBC News that Judge Adrian, quote, protected the girl with his ruling as much as he possibly could. It made me seem like I fought for nothing and that I left, like, put my word out there for no reason. Her father, Scott, also angry. My family is destroyed because of this. Scott says Cameron used to be an honor roll student who ran cross country in track and field. Now she's lucky to carry a C average and she's dropped out of all sports. All of her learning is at home now. She's She can't go to school. Despite what happened to her, Cameron says this shouldn't stop other victims from seeking justice. I think every other girl should know that this is a normal thing and they need to come out with what happens to them and not just let the guy get away. 
All right, Megan Fitzgerald joins us now live from Chicago. Megan, a petition is now circulating online to remove Judge Robert Adrian from his position. Can you tell us more about that? Well, Tom, you know, this situation has gotten national attention quickly. Uh, people are outraged. And so what we know is that a change.org petition has been filed. Uh, they're asking people for signatures, trying to get disciplinary action taken against this judge. So far, uh, more than 15,000 people have signed. Uh, we talked to legal experts, and they say, look, it is possible that this judge could be investigated uh, for misconduct. Tom. All right, Megan Fitzgerald for us tonight. Megan, thank you. When we come back, the murder investigation. A 16-year-old honor student shot 22 times as she walked her dog. The police from police tonight. And a new development in the rust set shooting. The evidence, Alec Baldwin, now has to turn over. Stay with us. All right, now to Top Stories news feed and the investigation into the deadly shooting of a teenager while she walked her dog. Police in Houston say Diamond Alvarez was shot 22 times just blocks from her home. Her parents heard the gunshots and found their dog outside the house. The body of the high school sophomore and honor roll student was discovered nearby. No arrests have been made. Police urging the public to come forward with any information. All right, now to the violent attack of a Good Samaritan in New York City. Watch this video because it, it really is hard to believe. New video shows a man who takes off his own coat and gives it to another person during a deep freeze on Wednesday. That's when the man on the ground jumps up and begins beating the victim before robbing him. This is the man that tried to help him. Police arrested the suspect. They say it's the second time in a week that he's attacked a Good Samaritan offering help. All right, new details on that deadly shooting on the set of Rust. Attorneys for Alec Baldwin say they have reached an agreement with Santa Fe officials to turn over the actor's cell phone this week. It comes just hours after the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office said they issued a warrant for Baldwin's phone on December 16th, but had not received it. And rapper Ye, formerly known as Kanye West, is under criminal investigation in L.A. Police say he is a suspect in an alleged battery that occurred early this morning. Sources confirming to NBC News the alleged attack started when someone began recording the rapper. Kanye has not been arrested. His representatives did not immediately respond to a request for comment. We want to head overseas now to one of the biggest stories we're following tonight, Buckingham Palace doing damage control. Queen Elizabeth stripping Prince Andrew of his military titles and other roles. The decision described as mutual as the prince faces a lawsuit by a woman who claims he sexually assaulted her. Keir Simmons has the latest. Tonight's humiliation for the Queen's second son. Royal sources confirming to NBC News he will no longer be called His Royal Highness, a title he was born with. Buckingham Palace saying in a statement, with the Queen's approval and agreement, the Duke of York's military affiliations and royal patronages have been returned to the Queen. The statement ending, he is defending this case as a private citizen. Virginia Jufri is suing Prince Andrew for alleged sexual assault when she was 17 years old. She says she was trafficked by the prince's friend, the late Jeffrey Epstein. It was a really scary time in my life. I had just been abused by a, a member of a royal family. The allegations continued despite Prince Andrew's years of denials, including saying he does not remember this photograph with Jufri and Ghislaine Maxwell, who was convicted last month on federal sex trafficking charges. I have no recollection of ever meeting this lady. None whatsoever. The dramatic palace announcement comes a day after a U.S. judge rejected the prince's bid to have the case thrown out, potentially leaving him to face cross-examination in court. All right, Keir Simmons joins us now from London. So, Keir, I guess the first question to you is, what does Prince Andrew do? I don't know if the royal family has ever been put in a situation like this. Yeah, it's embarrassing. It's humiliating for Prince Andrew. Uh, Tom, Prince Andrew is vowing uh, to keep fighting his legal fight. Uh, but look, he looks as if he's going to have to fight that uh, on his own. Uh, so this isn't a retreat from the law, but it's certainly a retreat from royal life. Just think about this. Those, those patronages, patronages uh, those titles, those are going to other members of the royal family. What that translates as? Prince Andrew is not coming back from this, no matter what the result of that civil case. So this is a day, uh, Tom, that the Queen hoped would never happen. Many believe that Prince Andrew is, is her favourite son. This is the year of her jubilee. Uh, I think Buckingham Palace 
came to the conclusion that it was just too damaging. They had to do something. They had to take this drastic action. Yeah, and the queen just losing her husband as well on top of all this. I have one more question for you, Kier. There really seems to be only two options here, right? Settle or, or face the court, face his accuser and fight for his name and his reputation. Is there any sense from royal watchers on what's going to happen? It's such a great question, Tom, because it just encapsulates why, in a sense, Prince Andrew finds himself in this position, because he has no good options. If he settles, it's kind of an admission, even if he manages to get his lawyers to say it isn't an admission. Uh, and at the same time, if, if this does end up in court, potentially, as I said in that report, he ends up having to give evidence. And it's all about just the humiliation. It's just about what it looks like on, on the public stage. Uh, you know, being a member of the fa royal family uh, can be brutal because because the royal family can be so brutal. I think what they've done here is take a cold, hard look at it. I think especially, potentially, Andrew's brother, Prince Charles, uh, and made this decision despite the fact that Prince Andrew is a member of the family. Tom? All right, Keir Simmons reporting live in from London. Keir, we thank you for that. Now to Top Stories Global Watch, and we begin with the rocket attack targeting the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. At least four rockets entered the heavily fortified green zone. Three struck the perimeter of the American Embassy. Another hit a nearby school. Some civilian injuries are reported. The U.S. Embassy said in a statement that terrorist groups were behind the attack but did not provide any further details. And the explosion damaging a critical gas pipeline in Venezuela. The country's state-owned oil company he says blasts. The blast was likely caused by people illegally tapping the pipeline for oil. It's supply gases to Venezuela's eastern states. Crews are now working to repair it and avoid disruptions as the country faces a gas shortage. At least three people were injured. And more U.S. diplomats appear to have been hit by the Havana syndrome. The Wall Street Journal reporting four more U.S. officials working in Geneva and Paris became sick with the mysterious illness. At least one was medevaced from Switzerland to the U.S. for treatment. They joined as many as 200 other diplomats who came down with the syndrome while stationed in countries around the world and still no answers on who's behind these attacks. All right, now to the Americas, where we take a look at stories coming out of the U.S. and across Latin America. Questions tonight in El Salvador. After dozens of journalists and activists say their cell phones were hacked, a watchdog group supporting those claims, and those affected suspect the country's government may be behind it. NBC News Now correspondent Zinclay Esamwa has more. Tonight, serious allegations of journalists' phones hacked in El Salvador. The news outlet El Faro saying most of its employees have been affected. That night, my phone started acting really strange. It got overheated in a weird way. The cause, spyware called Pegasus. According to watchdog group Citizen Lab and Access Now, and independently confirmed by Amnesty International using, quote, forensic data. How severe were these hacks? There were people who were hacked 42 separate times over a given period. That must be some kind of record. The attack compromised the phones of at least 22 reporters and other employees from July 2020 to November 2021, according to Watchdog Group. In so many cases, the hacking seemed to line up with journalists reporting on important scoops involving the El Salvadorian government. These two journalists are among them. In the period that we started to investigate the relationship between the Salvadorian government and MS-13, the government launched a defamation campaign against the newspaper. I'm certain that's the reason. We've been the newspaper that's been at the forefront of investigating corruption in this government. Investigative journalist Carlos Martinez experienced the longest duration of hacks, a total of 269 days, according to watchdog groups. His colleague Gabriel Labrador alleges he noticed his phone acting strange after this heated exchange with El Salvador's president. What's the risk of your electronics and your colleagues being compromised? Surely there will be sources that won't want to talk to us anymore, which makes our job more difficult. Our job is to obtain information and give it to the public. It'll be more complicated. When you hit a journalist, you hit society. The administration of President Nayib Bukele did not immediately respond for comment, though previously denied responsibility. Meanwhile, watchdog groups say the hacks didn't just hit El Faro, and at least 13 journalists from other news groups in El Salvador were also targeted. It remains unclear just who was using NSO surveillance technology to spy on these journalists. This spyware is only sold to governments, and a lot of circumstantial evidence is putting this at the doorstep of the El Salvadorian government. A spokesperson for NSO group tells NBC that the use of its technology to monitor dissidents, activists, and journalists is, quote, a severe misuse and goes against the desired use.
This recent alleged hack, just months after the U.S. blacklisted the Israeli firm, the NSO group, that produces Pegasus. We have been acutely concerned that commercial spyware, like NSO group software, poses a serious counterintelligence and security risk to U.S. personnel. For Martinez and Labrador, while they will continue their journalism, they say those risks continue to feel very real. What needs to change in order for you as a journalist to feel that your information is secure, but also as a citizen to feel that your rights are being properly honored? Well, today, inside El Salvador, one of the most frustrating things is that I consider it impossible to get justice. All right, Zinclair Asamoah joins us now live on set from here in, I should say, just live in studio here in New York City. So, Zinclair, I, I want to ask you, you know, these journalists talk about the risks getting bigger and bigger. Have they felt any other type of surveillance besides the phone hacking? Yeah, Tom, in addition to the phone hacks, they allege surveillance by unmarked government cars in front of their newsroom, in front of their homes. One of the most disturbing accounts I heard was even an allegation of physical assault from police. Of course, the government has not yet responded to us for comment, but all of these allegations are incredibly disturbing, Tom. All right, Sinclair SMW for us tonight. Sinclair, thank you for that. Coming up, the mothers who serve, the challenges for female soldiers during and after pregnancy. But tonight, the new legislation working to change change that. Welcome back. As the number of women serving in the military continues to grow, so does the need to support the maternity needs of moms. New legislation signed by President Biden now hopes to provide the care that they need. NBC's Ali Vitali sat down with one woman about her experience with the military and motherhood. After 20 years and nine deployments in the Army, Vivian Richards knows all about readiness. Readiness is like the biggest concern of any leader in the military, right? Do we have the personnel trained to the necessary level to go out and execute these combat missions? But in 2010, she was also ready for a new challenge, motherhood. In becoming pregnant and then having her first baby, it became clear that the system, as it existed, was not necessarily built with her in mind. When women integrated into the military, instead of going from gender-specific language like male or man, it was just kind of crossed out and put soldier. But that was not necessarily inclusive, right, of the female experience or the, the needs of a female soldier. She gave birth at a military facility because of her active duty status, where, due to shortages of OBGYNs, neonatal nurses, and midwives, Richard says she never even met her doctor until she showed up to deliver. When I got there, I had a medical team I'd never seen before. I had never seen, I've never met the nurse, I've never met the doctor, I'd never met anyone. It led to a birth experience that left Richards feeling unsafe. NBC News has reached out to the military facility but didn't hear back. Then, after eight weeks of leave with her newborn, it was back to work. While I did not deploy overseas within that window to a combat environment, I've had really close friends who are like struggling to like pump milk because they're still nursing their babies and they're on their way into a combat zone. And so there's a lot of commercials and, and, and media attention when a dad comes home and maybe is meeting their child for the first time. There's not a lot of coverage of a mother who leaves a six month old baby and then comes back to a baby that's not walking and talking. But Senator Tammy Duckworth, a fellow veteran and mom herself, is bringing that attention and legislating to fix it. Protecting Moms Who Served Act of 2021. The bipartisan Protecting Moms Who Served Act became law in December of last year, and it seeks to broaden the focus of veteran care to better serve the women who serve our country. Pushing millions into streamlining maternity care at veterans' health care facilities and studying maternal mortality rates among veterans. Why it take so long to make these changes? Not enough women in leadership positions. And as we've got more women into higher levels of leadership, this becomes an issue. And this, you know, I was able to bring this up because I had my lived experience. Now, Richard says it's about applying lived experience into legislation that works for everyone. And flipping the military's perceived readiness narrative around pregnancy from Richard's experience. Pregnancy is a threat to my to my readiness. Postpartum depression is a threat to my readiness. You know, that bonding period um, after delivery is a threat to my readiness if I can't turn and deploy that soldier rapidly back into the fight. To this. You can't put the, our military in a place where for 15% of its workforce we say, 
because you're going to get pregnant and that pregnancy has a negative effect on our readiness, you have to choose. Well, a lot of women choose to go and become moms and start their families and leave the military. That is millions and millions of dollars of training that goes out the door. All right, Ali joins us from Capitol Hill. Ali, I really appreciate you bringing this story to our show because it shines a light on something that has been very underreported. So you mentioned that part of the bill is to commission studies regarding military moms. What are they hoping to learn? Yeah, Tom, when you say it's an underreported issue, it's not for lack of trying. There's just a lack of data right now in this space. So one of the things that this law will seek to do is put money towards researching things that impact women who are pregnant and serving in our military. Things like mental health, but also military-specific things that can cause pregnancy complications. And then, of course, there is a focus now on maternal mortality rates. We know that maternal mortality is a problem that's getting more attention right now from people like Vice President Kamala Harris and, of course, lawmakers here in Congress. But what this law does is commission the first ever study on maternal mortality for women in the military, a problem that we know impacts everyone, but that impacts black and brown women more than white women. You know, and I want to go back to one of the things Richard said in that piece about the narrative around pregnancy in the military and, and women in the military in general. And I was thinking back on all the stories we do about veterans, the vast majority yeah. about uh, male veterans returning every now and then. Then we'll do, you know, a, a female veteran returning, but it's mostly men. And I wanted to ask you about that because that's something they, they sort of want to get out there that it's also women who are serving so bravely in this military. Yeah, it is. And it's not just the perception, right? If you look at the numbers, the amount of women who are serving in the military right now is growing. You hear Duckworth make the point that it's important to retain them because that's millions of dollars in training that leaves active duty when they actually decide to leave and if they make that choice around having a child. But there's also more tangible policy changes being made here that you see the military adapting in real time. Duckworth pointed this out to me. When she was active duty, she used to fly helicopters. She said she specifically didn't want to get pregnant during that time because she wouldn't be able to have a baby and continue to fly helicopters. That makes sense, but what she said is that when she later gave birth, at that point, active duty, paid leave and parental leave was only six weeks. What we actually saw at the end of last year is that that time period has now doubled. So the military offers 12 weeks of parental leave. Now, that's for men and women, but it shows that this is a body that is becoming more inclusive and trying to adapt with the times here as it moves forward. That's something that benefits it's men and women alike, but more aware of parenthood there. All right, Ali Vitali for us. Ali, thank you. When we come back, a thief stealing a minivan with a show dog inside. His owners asking for help on social media. How one local family tracked down this boxer and saved him after days in the freezing cold. Stay with us. Finally tonight, a desperate search. A prize-winning show dog, Jasper, was stolen. His owners taking to social media for help, and then one local family recognized the suspect and took it upon themselves to find that special dog. Michelle Baker shares a special bond with her boxer, Jasper. He's, and he's just the best dog you could ever meet. He's happy, he's friendly, like he's just a very good boy. Jasper's a show dog, winning best in breed at a St. Paul dog show just last week. But early the next morning, while Michelle was grabbing a coffee, her minivan was stolen with Jasper inside. Just watched him drive away. And in that moment, I thought that might be the last time that I ever saw that dog. And that was one of the hardest moments. It was a chilly weekend in Minnesota with temperatures plunging to 20 degrees below zero. That first night that he was out in that cold, it was it was insanely cold. Michelle took to social media asking for help. The response from social media was huge immediately. Just everybody was sharing it, sharing it, sharing it. We had, like I said, over 100,000, you know, shares on social media. Police released this surveillance image, and that's when James and Tara Wirtz stepped in. They recognized the suspect, a homeless man, as one of their family friends. He, he was my best friend, and I grew up with him. After that, he became my best man in my wedding. The couple spent hours driving around St. Paul looking for the van and Jasper and found it abandoned in an alleyway. Then luckily enough, we ended up seeing the van. Michelle, overwhelmed with emotion, not knowing if her beloved Jasper had survived more than 60 hours in the freezing cold. And I am on my knees crying harder than I've ever cried in my life. 
begging for my dog to be alive. As soon as we seen him pop his head up, I'm like, he's alive. He's okay. Like, we got him. I have never felt joy like I did when Tara told me that he was alive. Jasper feeling the warmth from Michelle again. The pair thankful for the family that stepped up. There is no doubt in my mind these people saved my dog's life. He would not have made it through another night. So great Jasper's back home. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. I will see you right back here tomorrow on Friday night. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.